Hello and for person, this is Anton, and in this video we're going to explore some of the recent and I guess somewhat unusual discoveries in regards to photosynthesis. The super important biological process that turns sunlight into chemical energy used by most life on the planet. Which in some sense makes light the source of life on Earth, because the energy from the sun is converted into useful chemical energy inside various plants algae and quite a lot of different bacteria. And that's because during photosynthesis they basically create various complex sugars in the complex machinery you see right here that uses photons of light for its operation. But in all honesty, even today, the actual mechanism on how all of this works is still not super clear. There are still quite a lot of different mysteries in regards to photosynthesis and specifically individual steps inside a typical chloroplast where all of these reactions usually take place. But intriguingly, in one of the recent studies, scientists finally confirmed how extremely efficient this process is by basically observing the beginning of photosynthesis, which apparently can start with just a single photon. In other words, just one photon is required to kickstart photosynthesis somewhere deep inside a typical chloroplast. Now, based on decades of research, we sort of understand the basic principles of photosynthesis and we know that it does involve a lot of different complexes and a lot of these molecular factories that basically use photons in order to turn water and CO2 into much more complex carbon-based molecules. With this very complex process visualized right here in this beautiful video from California Academy of Sciences. But it wasn't entirely clear if chlorophyll can actually start these reactions with just one photon or if there was some kind of a minimum required before this process begins. We just knew one thing. We knew that this depended on excited electrons that would help transfer this energy through chloroplasts until they become these sugars. But based on previous research, it also became pretty apparent that these chloroplasts seem to be super sensitive to light. We'll actually discuss a separate study about this in just a few minutes, but this is based on observations from a lot of different locations where photosynthesis seemed to happen in very shady or even dark conditions with barely any light present. And this led to the assumption that you only needed a few photons to start the reaction, but the question was how many? And so up until this point, the first step of photosynthesis has never been observed. But in one of the more recent studies, researchers behind the study you see right here designed a really intriguing experiment by using chlorophyll from a very well-known bacterium. A purple bacterium, Rhodobacter spheroides, that contains several rings responsible for the photosynthetic reaction that can be isolated and controlled in experimental conditions. One of the reasons this bacterium was used is actually because it has a direct connection to a lot of different plants and algae and is technically their ancient ancestor. And so here scientists designed a really intriguing experiment where a single laser pulse was able to produce a single photon. A photon that would then be split into two parts, with one going into the chloroplast of this bacterium and the other one going to a detector. And so basically here they were able to fire two photons at a time. And intriguingly, during each single test, it seemed to result in a photosynthetic reaction. Or basically every single photon resulted in fluorescence that could only be produced as a result of photosynthesis. And because this test was conducted over 1 million times, with basically over 1.5 million detections, here, this was a definitive confirmation that in order to activate photosynthesis, you just need one single photon. Confirming that this is indeed an extremely sensitive reaction and in theory can function in barely any light. And that was actually a really important first discovery. But then, even more recently, in a separate study by Clara Hope and her team, researchers physically discovered how extremely sensitive this reaction is by literally finding photosynthetic reaction in some of the darkest locations on the planet. And here this involved an expedition. Specifically an arctic expedition where the researchers drilled into the ice and then lowered extremely sensitive light sensors to a depth of approximately 50 meters, 160 feet. And this was actually to test how much light you would need to have before photosynthesis stops working. Or just to rephrase this, they were testing low light photosynthesis in order to see when it stops functioning in the depths of the ocean. This was part of the so-called mosaic field campaign in the central arctic ocean and the idea was to measure the changes in the algae biomass as it's suspended in almost complete darkness. And well, obviously, as you go deeper and deeper in the ocean, the overall photosynthesis decreases 
And so here we had a relationship between photosynthetic biomass and light availability. But what was really surprising is the fact that even at a depth of 50 meters, and even in super low light levels, equivalent to 0.04 micromoles of photons per square meter, or approximately 50,000 times less light than what we usually get in a typical daylight conditions, even here, in almost complete darkness, there was still photosynthesis, and algae was still growing, and still converting CO2 and water into sugars. Which was a direct confirmation that you barely need any photons for photosynthesis to work. Or at least when it comes to this arctic algae. Now it's possible that it's because of its structure and maybe some genes that it has that a lot of other plants don't have that allows it to basically use even minuscule amounts of light. But even despite that, this was a definitive proof that photosynthesis is extremely effective and can obviously work in very dark conditions. Which is actually really important for a lot of different fields. For example, obviously, in agriculture, by discovering what kind of genes this algae uses that makes it so efficient at photosynthesis, it might be even possible to genetically modify certain plants to basically grow in almost complete darkness, even maybe in the middle of the night, by just using moonlight. So essentially, it might be possible to develop crops that grow in very dark conditions by learning from this algae and discovering how it does it as well. And then it's also important for space sciences, and specifically our attempts at maybe one day colonizing a moon or a planet where we know there is just not enough sunlight. For example, we know that some of the more extreme objects, such as the Saturn's moon Titan, is extremely dark. But it also has a lot of exciting conditions on the surface, very thick atmosphere, different types of liquid cycles, and different types of resources that could be used for some kind of a colony. But Saturn is very far away from the Sun, so it gets just a fraction of sunlight compared to planet Earth. And Titan is also very opaque, so it very likely just gets something like 0.03% of sunlight even at noon. But that surprisingly is still more sunlight than what this algae was using to produce photosynthesis. Which means that in theory, even on Titan photosynthesis could be possible. And this idea of space farming is not just some kind of a science fiction concept. It's already been studied and proposed several times, and various plants like spinach, lettuce and potatoes have already been grown on the International Space Station. But because in some locations, like for example even our own moon, sunlight can be kind of limited, knowing that photosynthesis seems to work in even extreme conditions is obviously a really exciting discovery. It means that one day, if we do have some kind of a colony on Mars, that depend on algae for the production of food and for the production of oxygen, these farms will work even in really dark conditions, even if Mars goes through one of its notorious storms. Moreover, this also confirms that photosynthesis could work around other dimmer stars, such as the red dwarfs, and could function in very dark conditions, assuming of course there is water and carbon dioxide. Which means that theoretically, if photosynthesis evolves somewhere else, it can be possible and can be efficient in a lot of diverse environments and on a lot of diverse planets. Or at least it would function in theory. We obviously have no idea if it does exist somewhere else out there, and we're probably not going to know this for a very long time, but one day, possibly in the near future, we might be able to test photosynthesis, possibly starting with the moon, and possibly one day on Mars. Which is why these discoveries from right here on Earth are kind of exciting. And so one day, if one of the modern telescopes discover signs of photosynthesis on some kind of a different planet out there, it's really studies like this that might actually explain what's going on there. But until these future discoveries, or until we learn something else about photosynthesis, that's pretty much all I wanted to mention. Thank you for watching, subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support this channel on Patreon by joining the channel membership, or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.